When I say behavior-driven development, what do you think? I think it's possible that if you've never heard of BDD before, you may be closer to the truth than if you have. For many people who have come across the term BDD, you probably think of tools like Cucumber and Specflow. This is a bit like thinking of gear sticks when I talk about driving. These are tools that we may choose to use for BDD, but they don't define it. If you've been involved in BDD, you might be thinking about the collaboration between people. Perhaps you've heard of the three amigos and the importance of working together to explore the problem in front of us. I'd argue that these are part of the value that we get, sure, and maybe part of the strategy, but also don't really define the approach. So what is BDD and why is it important? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis, Transfic, and new sponsor Launch Darkly. All of these companies offer products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, click on the links in the description below and check them out. People often ask me about the t-shirts that I wear in the comments section below the videos. So we contacted the company that I get most of my t-shirts from, QWERTY, and they now very kindly offer a big discount for viewers of this channel. So if you like my t-shirts, check out the QWERTY catalogue and get some nice shirts and a great deal. Links in the description below for that too. Like nearly all successful ideas, BDD is widely misunderstood. I was close to the birth of the idea when my colleagues at ThoughtWorks, Dan North and Chris Matz, worked to formulate a better way to communicate and teach the ideas that we were finding so valuable in our project. The initial starting point for BDD was to try and find a way to get the people who we were teaching to do te test-driven development to get to the real high value of this approach more quickly. If you've ever watched many of my videos on this channel, you'll know that I believe that TDD is one of the biggest steps that software development has taken uh, in improving our practice, at least during my time. TDD amplifies the talent of a software developer by giving us great early feedback on the quality of our designs that no other technology or practice that I've ever seen can match. The trouble is that when it's misunderstood in ways that people often misunderstand it and done badly, it can limit your scope of your change, the change to your designs, create complex, slow, unwieldy tests that are tightly coupled to your code, and as a result, slow the whole development process. Your code will still work because it's tested, but it will get increasingly difficult to change. This poor result is very co a very common pattern, and we were seeing it in a lot of teams uh, during the time when BDD was invented. Actually, this is not the fault of TDD at all. This is really about people mistaking what TDD was all about and doing something else entirely. So the idea of BDD was to try and help people to avoid this all-too-common misstep. The mistake that people were making was that they confused test-driven development with good unit testing. The big mistake is that they assumed that TDD meant chasing code coverage in tests. When you practice TDD, you get great coverage. But that's as a side effect, not a goal. And if you set it as a goal, you miss the point entirely and almost never get what you really want, which is the ability to build better software faster. Test-driven development is specifically about writing the test first. After all, you can't dri drive development from tests if you don't start with a test. Drive development from tests means that testing is the initiating force, the driver. So Dan and Matt started thinking about how to better communicate this idea. And the obvious starting point was to try and find better words. It's fairly obvious that if it's called test-driven development, then it's all about testing, right? 
Well, kind of, but actually it's much more about an approach to design and development than it is about testing. The tests are great, but the impact on design and development are greater. The tests we create aren't really tests. They're really something else. This is still a common problem today. Many of the questions that I get from people when talking about test-driven development and even acceptance test-driven development are still about how should we test this implementation detail? When that really isn't the right question to be asking at all. So we had this comms problem in teaching TDD that Chris and Dan looked to address. I helped to write one of the first public descriptions of BDD, which was on a wiki called behaviourdriven.org. It's actually still there if you want to take a look. And one of the first things we wrote was BDD is about getting the words right. So instead of test cases, BDD talks about specifications. And instead of test, it talks about scenarios. So the idea of BDD is that you start working by creating a specification for what it is that you'd like your change to the software to add in terms of the visible behavior that it expresses from the point of view of one of your users. This still confuses lots of people. But the simplest way that I can find to express this idea is this. Stop thinking about how your software works completely. Now, think about the things that your software does from the point of view of its users. Whoever they may be, imagine them arriving at the point where they are going to use your software and now imagine what it is that they want to achieve. That goal, that thing that they want to achieve is what we want to capture in the specification. Their, their goal isn't to enter data into a form or press buttons. The UI on your software isn't what people want to do with your software. That's merely your guess at how they can do whatever it is that they want to do. Let me give you a simple example. You could write a test like this, and it doesn't say what this code is supposed to do. If you study this closely and know something about web development and Selenium, the Selenium testing framework, you might be able to, after carefully reading it, figure out what this test is doing. Or I could write the test like this, and now you know exactly what this code is meant to do. But now you have no idea how the code being tested actually works. You don't even know whether or not this is a web application. Just to be clear, these are the same test. The second approach is a lot more valuable for a whole variety of reasons. In the first example, we already see that this is more difficult to understand. In order to understand it, you need to know a lot more stuff. You need to know a bit about how web pages work. You need to know that XPath, what XPath is and how that works. And you need to guess a bit about the problem domain, based on some of the names in the labels, perhaps. What if, in this case, Amazon had used more obscure names? Or you didn't recognize the URL? Would you still be able to tell what this test was doing then? Now imagine that you had hundreds of these tests. Could you find the one that you wanted quickly and easily? So, so this test has built a barrier between the people that wrote it and anyone who doesn't share their technical implementation detail focused context. This is one way in which the much more effective way of specifying things in the second test assists with that important collaboration that I mentioned at the start. We'll come back to that later. The other problem with the first test is that it is tightly coupled to the code that it's testing. The smallest change here invalidates the test. If Amazon changes the ID of a label or the class of a div, this test will break. In fact, I guarantee you, if you try and run this test, it will fail because I wrote it several years ago and I'd be astonished if Amazon haven't changed their code since then. If I want to run this test against the mobile version or against my bookshopping robot, this test is entirely useless. I will have to write a different version of it again from scratch. Now, it's true that all this detail has to exist somewhere for this test to work. But even so, if I write the test like this, then there is no real reuse. So every similar test will have to redo all of this work. Here's the second test again. Remember, this is the same test. 
The test is wholly focused on what the user wants, the goal, rather than the mechanism. By doing this, we make it instantly readable. It is clear to anyone who has ever wanted to buy a book, even if they've never heard of Amazon. Underneath this code, there is exactly the same code that I showed you in the first test, but that detail hasn't leaked into this test. If Amazon changed their implementation, I can change the plumbing underneath this test without changing the test, and then the test will pass again. You could say that this was true for the first test too, but not in the same way. There are two important differences here. First, the second approach scales better. By organizing my tests in a way that hides the mapping of these domain level link concepts to the implementation detail of my system, it's much more obvious that I can reuse these domain level of abstractions in other tests. Lots of similar tests will need to search for books or assert that a particular item is in a shopping basket, for example. So if my implementation of my shopping basket changes, however it changes, I can fix lots of different tests now in a single step. So maintaining my test is much, much easier. The second important difference is, I think, even more important, though maybe a bit more subtle. In the second example, even when I've changed my system under test in a way that's broken the test, the test case itself is still correct. So I still have a clear, accurate statement of what my system is meant to do. My example here is about a whole system. And I think that this is the context where most people think of BDD. But as I've already described, this wasn't really where BDD came from originally. It was broader than that. Nearly all that I've said here is equally applicable everywhere that we write a test. One of the commoner questions that I get when I talk about BDD is from teams working on platforms or back-end systems. And to paraphrase that question, it's, what do you mean? I have to write my tests from the perspective of an end user on a web page? Well, no, that is isn't it at all. The idea is to think about tests of your software based on the behavior that they exhibit to a user of that software rather than thinking in terms of testing your software from the perspective of you, the producer of the software. This is a huge difference in perspective, and it forces you to think in terms of someone, or indeed something, using your software. So now you're forced to think about designing it from the outside. This has lots of positives too. If my test is difficult to write, then that means that my code is difficult to use. If I write my test as a specification rather than a test, then I'm going to write it first before I write the code, obviously. This is true whatever the level of the test. So now I'm the first person to experience using my software. And unless I'm some kind of fool, I'm not going to make, want to make my own life more difficult. So treating our tests as specifications means that we're forced to take the perspective of a user of our software. If your code is some kind of back-end platform kind of thing, then your users are other programmers, but they're still your users. And wherever your code sits, if it's easier to use, it's better. If we write our high-level acceptance tests as BDD specifications before we start work on a new feature, we document what our system is meant to do in a way that is accessible to everyone, whatever their background whether they understand how the system works or not. So, as well as being more durable in the face of change as a result of this abstraction, our tests now provide a better functional description of what the software actually does, and we know it does it because this test passed. To do this, we use the language of the problem rather than the language of the solution. This means that we're establishing a better, more effective communication between everybody involved. I've recently come to think of this as a process of translation. And like anything else complicated, we are going to make a better job of this if we can proceed in a series of small, simpler steps. We start with a rather vague idea of what our users want. This isn't wrong, that is that it's vague, it's always vague. 
Dev teams don't know what users want. Product owners don't know what users want. Domain experts may guess what users want, but they don't really know. And if you ask the users, they don't know either. So when you start on a new feature, it's always only a best guess. It's somebody's best guess. Maybe it's a good guess, maybe not. We won't really know this until it's in the hands of users and they tell us. Because while users don't know what they want, they're pretty good at telling you whether they like something that they've got or not, once they can see it. So it's actually helpful if our first thoughts are a bit vague. The more specific they are, the more likely they are to be wrong. If I'm buying books, then I'm certainly going to need to go to the store find a book I like and add it to my shopping cart. But the detail of whether that's through a web page, my phone or via my new thought controlled interface is implementation detail. It's my choice. And so inevitably more likely to change and so more fragile. So vague is a good place to start. At the other end of this process, the whole point of this exercise is to be so precise that even that ultimate in pedantry, a computer, can follow the steps. So here is our translation. Our job is to go from some vague wish to a specific solution in code. The huge mistake that most organizations take is to attempt that translation in too few steps. Most organizations go straight to the solution and specify that as requirements. BDD fixes that. We start with our vague wish and we capture that as a user story, which just refines it just a little bit. It's a little bit more precise. It must not say anything though about how the software actually works. Instead, it describes a small increment in the functionality of, the, of our system from the perspective of a user of it. Next, we come up with a series of concrete examples that if they existed in our system would demonstrate that our system is doing the useful thing in our software that we want it to. These examples are acceptance criteria. These should be more specific than the story. If, we, if our story was about buying books, now we might be talking about an example where we're thinking about a specific book and what happens. These are scenarios that we collect together to capture our specification. And the next step in our translation process is to make these things executable. This means implementing the plumbing that sits beneath our test cases. Now we have an executable specification which we can use to drive the rest of our development process. When these tests pass, our process of translation is complete. There's a lot more detail to BDD than this, and its use in acceptance test-driven development is a little bit different to its use in test-driven development. But in both cases, the outside-in perspective, the focus on outcomes rather than implementation detail, and treating the tests that we write as specifications of what we want our code to do rather than tests of how it works, have a huge impact on our results in development. This is by far the most effective way to drive quality into our designs, while retaining our freedom to change our minds as we learn more and our view of the problem and our designs change. Thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoy my stuff, please consider supporting our work on this channel by joining our Patreon community. Thank you again.